practice section. Who you, uh, you guys who are the regular Phillips know that we've been doing intersections for 11 years now in the real space. But given the COVID crisis, given the shutdown, and given that the whole world is turning to digital, we started um, digital intersections. And Luca was the first person who I invited to join us and create a special work, special commission for the Phillips. And that is what we're gonna be hear, hearing and uh, seeing. And it's called Picture Present, which is part of the Astrodow, the Quarantine Chronicle series, addressing oh. the COVID crisis. What else? Not just as a health crisis, but as a crisis that affected all social levels or operating in trifecta, economics, politics, um, racial uh, relations, and everything else that we're going through now. Um, Taras has been at the UMD. Um, I learned since 2012. He did a lot of wonderful things at the UMD gallery, including a recent show of Jonathan Monaghan, and really initiated a wonderful series of uh, visiting artist lecture projects. And maybe he will have a chance to speak about that a little more. But um, this is just in brief uh, to, to just put things in context. I hope that um, you enjoyed tonight. As uh, Miguel said, we will have quite a bit of time at the end for questions and answers. So please hold off till this last part of the conversation so we can hear Luca uh, talk about the inception of the projects, about his earlier work that involves this very interesting character, Astrodad, who is essentially an astronaut floating in the space until he lands on Earth and finds a chaos. There is a lot of humor in Luca's work, but I will let him speak about that and have the two of them in a conversation. So I thank you again for joining us tonight. And until later on, enjoy the talk and the conversation. I turn it to you guys. Luca, I think you go first. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much to uh, Vesela for inviting me and giving me this wonderful opportunity to interact uh, with uh, the Philips collection and with uh, its audience. And uh, thank you, Taras, for um, accepting to lead this conversation. I would like to thank all the, the staff at the Philips collection that made also a wonderful work. And, uh, and my friend, a uh, wonderful artist and writer, Mark Harris, who helped me to shape and improve the text in this episode, specific episode. So maybe, uh, shall we let's introduce uh, Taras now? What do you think? Yeah, sure. I'd, yeah. I'd love to be introduced. Um, uh, thank, thank you, first and foremost, um, Vesela and the entire staff of the Phillips Collection. And I, I just want to do a very, very brief introduction because I think it's, it's, um, uh, it's necessary um, to all the staff of the Phillips Collection for the terrific work and specifically the Intersections program and now digital intersections um, that allows us this format to be able to interact with a fantastic artist such as Luca. Um, but I think one of the great things that we'll kind of dive into with, with Luca's work is that um, Lu Luca's work for me as, as a curator, and I'm sure um, uh, Vesla has a, a similar perspective on this, is that you know at the core of everything that we do, it's object-based interaction and scholarship. That's at the core of what curators and artists do. And so, uh, you know, when we're stuck in this kind of a situation where, where we're not only be able to interact with the physical objects, but be able to interact with colleagues in a way that's very natural and very innately human, it acts as, I think, probably the ultimate impediment. And, you know, we, we might as well just, <laughs> you know, devolve and walk back into our caves, you know, not, not come out. Um, but, you know, this is something that we all did not necessarily you know foresee but it is something that has kind of popped up and it's a, a crisis on many fronts um, of which uh, Luca's work will kind of um, discuss um, but before we kind of get into um, you know the current project with the Phillips um, Luca I was wondering if you could maybe tell our audience a little bit about um, kind of the the beginnings of Astrodoubt, you know, the beginnings of, of, of this, this character, this astronaut character who, who makes um, his or her, or I don't know, the, the gender may be kind of ambiguous as well, you know, with the suit, um, uh, uh, 
interaction, you know, in, in, in various manifestations and maybe kind of going back to your original project with NASA that, that may probably interest people. Yes, thank you. Well, there are many origins to Astrodoubt. Um, on a, and I'll try to, to mention maybe going back and forth uh, to the different phases. Most uh, of all, I would say the, the most personal factor was that uh, I, as you can see from the damaged facial nerves, uh, I, I recently recovered from an advanced and aggressive cancer. So I felt particularly vulnerable to the arrival of this pandemic. So in, uh, I felt I had to protect myself uh, when the pandemic arrived, but also uh, I was physically unable to, to travel. My appointments, uh, my travel abroad were canceled, my studio visits were canceled, and I had to find a, a mental space mainly where to protect myself from the anxiety about the future. So I immediately thought of, of a project that allowed me through pen, paper, and internet to immediately conceive a narrative and, uh, and share it through social media in a, at a speed which had to uh, match the speed of the growth of, uh, of, um, of COVID. And in fact, I began this in the mid-March, the day when I found that my, the swimming pool was closed. <laughs> and suddenly I went back and said, gosh, I have to do something. But in a way, Astrodoubt has many origins. At the time I was working uh, on a project that I, I was trying to address the idea of cancer itself and uh, my own experience also through dark humor, because I still feel the power, the transgressive power of humor. And it was very difficult to f imagine how, what shape it would take. I also had logged in one idea uh, in this space doubt project, an idea about the quarantine that the Apollo 11 astronauts had to do when they came back to Earth after the moon landing in 1969. So I merged this with my desire to go back to a narrative and uh, which is something and, and uh, something that went back to a project I began, gosh, I'm afraid to say in 27 years ago, uh, not a superhero. And if it's okay with you, I'll start sharing some of these, uh, the not a superhero uh, images. Some of you actually recognize or so are familiar with uh, this and uh, let me go to uh, anyway it's a multimedia project very much like Astrodoubt started with sculpture comic book narrative with this character named not a superhero uh, the sign here this was at the drawing center in 94 in New York and the the comic book narrative which uh, and here I want to stop sharing because I want to sh show you the actual objects and uh, which I have here. The, the, the handmade comic books were collaged narrative and uh, narratives. Uh, it's in a series of 13 episodes all handmade of which I made limited edition of 10. And, uh, but they also go back to my original passion for or comic books that I had since I was a child, a very shy and nerdy guy. And from the age of 10, the age of eight to the age of 10, I made uh, this series of, of comic books uh, with my own character named Supermark. <laughs> and so if you, if you have your own comic books made as a child, keep them. Or, or if you have children who have them, encourage them to do them. So, from these early comic books, I went back with Not a Superhero as he uh, basically was in this constant search to become a superhero again, to become, to reach the moment where, um, and let me share again now, where there was no separation between uh, uh, the imaginary and the real. And in fact, uh, in the, let me see here. Uh, in fact, I, the end of the origin, the following episode seven, ends with a self-portrait I made at the age of 10, how I wish to be and how I am. 
in which I first locate the awareness of the split between imaginary and real. Anyway, I'll just go quickly through that because to show how even the sculpture in which I was revisiting existing superheroes from the Incredible Hulk, the Human Torch, uh, can't you see that I'm burning the thing, and uh, the Silver Surfer, in, not in the title, but uh, in this one you recognize uh, thrown into existence based on Spider-Man. So through this revisitation of the existing collective imaginary and this mythology and uh, through my own character, uh, super, I reached the, this world. And here I just want to show you in relationship to the kind of narrative that I was doing, which is parallel to what I'm doing now. This is the uh, issue number 10, Behind the Mask. And uh, with uh, the Luca Bugoli comic sign, not the superhero small sign, and the behind the mask sign, two large sculptures which are in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art. And here you see the original comics. And the narrative that I that permeates this episode is a combination of philosophical quotation, psychoanalytical discourse, and the bombastic tone of. Uh, of uh, superheroes. So when I get in the current project, uh, Astrodark also is a, um, a character who um, pretends to be an astronaut. In a way, in a way, he actually, he, I, I wouldn't say way, it's he, she, they wear this suit in fear of the environmental crisis that uh, is about to happen. And, uh, and then, uh, find themselves locked and stuck on earth, uh, experiencing this pandemic. And the episodes themselves try to combine uh, the aspiration towards uh, outer space, uh, towards something that is beyond the reality, which are mostly depicted through imaginary um, scenes and uh, daily events. For example, I can show you again, let me see. Um, episode, uh, okay, I'll show, well, in a way, I'll show you this, this one suspended. Let me share the screen again. This is actually, this is uh, on, uh, on the, um, Instagram account, so space mission suspended, flights canceled, parks closed, stores shut down, everyone locked down, locked down in their homes or shelters. I've not seen friends in a long time. This would be perfect timing for an alien abduction. And of this one, I also made uh, the, if I find it, yes, a short, uh, um, animation. And just to show you how, again, the the relationship between the reality that uh, Astrolab lives uh, and, uh, and uh, desperation. In other episodes, uh, I thought, uh, um, let me um, share this one. Let me see. Um, I want to show you. Uh, actually, you know what? I'll show you a clip at this point uh, of uh, of, uh, let me see, actually, let me stop. Let me go back to the PowerPoint here. And, uh, okay, I'll just go quickly through these uh, characters of the, uh, not the superhero. Can I mention but... something, um, Luca, while, while you're, you're, while you're you know, scrolling through yeah. and stuff is, um, you know, what really drew me to, you know, the Astrodot character was that on the, on the one hand, um, he's stranded here, you know, because of, you know, um, 
health related reasons and you know all this stuff and he's kind of stuck but you know he's kind of trying to cope and do the best he can in like this terrible situation and it's interesting in the sense that um you, you posited him in in um you know works of art that are found in Philip's collection and um, a lot of them tend to be these types of crowd scenes where you know now we're not allowed to gather in crowds and so you kind of stick him in there because you know on the one hand he's protected to a certain degree he has extra protection because he you know he has a spacesuit but at the same time he kind of stands out too there's this kind of um you know multi-layered approach to belonging yet not belonging as a human being as a species Can you kind of go into a little bit about you know your your process in in integrating uh, astro doubt into you know the phillips collections you know works and and why which ones you chose and and why yes that's a good point let me share now just to, I, I imagine that most of you if not all of you have seen the episode that uh, uh, Vesel gave me the opportunity to shape and, and actually one of the most exciting things about this is that this is a, I, I had a few museum solo shows and many group shows and biennials, but this is the first time that I was invited to interact with a permanent collection of a museum, which I love to do because I, people who know me know how I am an art addict. I see a lot of exhibitions, uh, I look at art constantly. So here, the, the, the ability to inhabit the space of the painting allow me to wander through the space. I given, uh, it, was, it was given a, a relative freedom, but I wanted to be respectful of the work. I mean, there is a lot of art about art. It's easy, I mean, somehow to make fun of other people's work, but I wanted to respect it also because I studied painting for four years at the Academy of Fine Arts. I still make painting is one of the most uh, challenging and, and interesting medium in, in, uh, in, in this series of Spaced Out. I have many paintings. So I, I, the first part was of course the research of try to find the pieces from different periods, different regions, different artists. I was looking also for some unknown artists. And in fact, uh, Alan Rowan Kreit, uh, was, you see, was the beginning of the story, was a fantastic painter, an artist I did not know. Others I knew from my studies of uh, European uh, painting uh, at the Academy of Fine Arts, like Barbara Hepworth, uh, Bonard, uh, Fouillard, and uh, Horace Pippin, another fantastic art artist that I discovered when I came to the United States on a Fulbright and for a degree and I remained. And, I, and of course, uh, Renoir actually, who is so well known, I, I initially tried to avoid such a recognized name, but then it was the most festive representation of this joy of gathering again. I, so the presence of Astrodot is very ghostly and uh, appears, but without really interferes appears there, is barely legible here next to the violin player. And uh, in the clay, clay here, actually uh, outside. And the Thomas is there in, in, without trying to disrupt the beautiful abstraction of our work. The most challenging and exciting discovery was this painting by Forrest Bess, who seemed to have discovered and uh, predicted coronavirus already with this. The title is Prophecy. Forrest Best is a fantastic artist, um, was an artist who had a very peculiar, very curious uh, life. Uh, those of you who know about his experience should, should get involved. And the painting is beautiful and it really gave shape to the story. And then uh, um, Ryder, another artist I loved actually since I was a a kid, I had a book on American painting in Italy, and I remember seeing these uh, sunsets, uh, beautiful, and ended up with uh, this dream. But the, the process I was, again, trying to stay on the margin, try not to overwhelm it. I was tempted to do animation at first, which is the medium which I've been involved with since the early 90s. But animation, anything, those of you who know animation, anything that moves uh, capture, captures, uh, captures our attention much more than a static image. It's just a 
gestalt psychology uh, rule and therefore I would have really diminished. I, what I wanted to do is to bring these paintings uh, uh, to the current context. Uh, many people uh, admire them as artworks, uh, sorry, uh, but we lost what was the original context and uh, this, the dead bird, uh, the Pope the school, the, 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 the funeral here. The title of this painting by Bonnard is a narrow street, I think, in Paris. But it's, of course, a funeral. Whose funeral was it? Who knows? Could it be someone's funeral, someone who perished for uh, COVID? So it's actually, and whose parade is this one in Harlem in, 1940, in the 40s? And could it be to celebrate? So the idea that art is all contemporary, is always contemporary. Mm -hmm. And uh, it keeps changing meaning and context throughout times. And I, I was really fascinated also by the notion of, the, of time in, uh, in a museum. Time, museums, of course, have many multiple and changing definitions, as you well know. You know? But they're also supposed to be uh, preserving, in a way, for the future generations, the art that they collect. And the idea of this permanence that they suggest in relationship to the fluidity of the medium and the speed of Instagram, I was really also challenged and fascinated me. So how, and also the, the contrast between a slow medium like painting uh, and the fast medium of the digital internet uh, that allow us to perceive these works now in these months. Uh, I know that many of us have seen a lot of, lot of art online, uh, mm -hmm. but very little physical art. Luca, can you, can you talk a little bit about um, the, the selection of, of the text, you know, and the fonts? Because, um, you know, in looking at all these works, I mean, it seems as though you, you not only spent a lot of time trying to be as minimally invasive with the character of Astro Doubt in these compositions, but you, you, it just seems as though you did a fantastic job at researching the font faces that were applicable of that style, what you would have seen if you were able to see beyond certain, you know, areas of, of, of the space, you know, and it all, almost in many ways, um, it reminds me of, uh, um, medieval manuscripts, how there's the tradition of not just image and text, but you would oftentimes see these manuscript, manuscript illuminators actually writing in the marginalia, having characters doing funny things or, or, or um, you know, serious things or extensions of, of, of religious or biblical subjects in the marginalia as if it's, it's, it's not important enough to be, and it shouldn't be as a core part of the work, but I still want to put it there as kind of almost a footnote. No, that's a very <laughs> well. In a way, the relationship between the visual and verbal language has always been a crucial component. And yes, I did a lot of research on fonts that related to the period, to the region. For example, in the Barbara Hesford, I went to study, look for posters done in in the UK. Um, of medical subject in the 40s. So, and that's, these are the fonts that I extracted from them. These, of course, with Bonard and Vuillard, it's much easier because they themselves did amazing lecturing and magazines and illustrators. So the, the problem was not to try, not to copy their own font, but find other articles that I could integrate in this language. And uh, the Horace Pippin, actually, I wanted to show you, uh, here the, the scene depicted is this family playing domino. And I thought of using the domino play and structure to create a kind of a crossword uh, sentence, almost like a plan view, an aerial view of the table uh, where the family is playing. So it's a variety of, uh, of sources, yes. And uh, with clay also, it was very easy because Bocle also did amazing integration of language uh, in, uh, in his own work. And uh, with uh, Forest Mesa, it had to be more, something more dramatic also, comic book-like, horror movies almost because of the scene requiring it. But I, this goes back, I wanted to go back to 
the the origin of all my attention for my interest in uh, can you see all this in on the screen now mm -hmm. okay it, it goes back to comic books and from the age of uh, after those comics that you saw I was doing as a child as a teenager I kept drawing comic books with these ex existential dramas and so on and uh, uh, stories which I was at the time as a teenager was going to publish or try to get the attention of of course nobody <laughs> expressed them but there were something this is a, a story about Venice that I drew, I drew when I was 16 years old but I, it already allowed me the to discover the involvement and the pleasure of the relationship between the, the visual uh, language and the composition that is also still has been nurtured in my work from the not a superhero through the meta futurist work and so on and um, so and I want to show you actually now talking I wanted to go back to outer space which is the the realm that uh, Astrodot feels more comfortable in and also to create uh, the association between uh, the, the daily event. In this case, we see the shape that we usually attribute to the description of a black hole. But in the, mid, uh, the following scene, we see that actually it's the vacuum cleaner sucking up <laughs> the, the activity uh, that we have been trapped to doing our homes in most of the uh, cases. So here, black holes uh, are regions of space where the gravitational pull is so strong that nothing can escape, not even light. We only notice black holes when they feed, swallowing a star. And uh, here the language is even following the movement towards the black hole, being absorbed in a spiral. Astronomers believe that there are black holes at the center of each galaxy, including our own the Milky Way. All clusters of galaxies are part of the cosmos and at the center of the co our cosmic depression, there is coronavirus and so on. So the connecting the banal, the outer space, the infinite and coronavirus and continues like that. If two black holes are in close orbit of each other and they get too close, they merge. When they merge, they generate gravitational waves that are felt across the universe. Like the ripple effect of that the many closing businesses in this pandemic are having on the economy, and so on. So and this is what I, I find, of course, uh, humor is a good justification, allows transgression, allows freedom of association, which, uh, and uh, I want to say something else about the particular episode of the Phillips collection, the other, interesting thing that uh, besides the, the, the interaction with the collection is that it was supposed to be the first color episode. And uh, when I wrote and when I, uh, uh, but in the meantime, actually another uh, interesting episode, an, an important event uh, took place uh, in our uh, realm and which was the decision of the Supreme Court uh, of course, to give rights to LGBT people. So I couldn't resist to, this was actually the first color scene. But the first real full episode is, uh, is the one uh, that the, the, the Phillips is. Because as you notice from the one I show you, everything was under the constraint of, uh, of uh, black and white, black and white, in a way to reflect and create a parallel between the extreme restriction we were living every day and uh, but also making it into a kind of a blackboard. Can, black I, can I interrupt just for just for one sec? Um, so I know we were talking a lot about the uh, um, you know the, the works and how they they're drawn from uh, um, uh, the permanent collection of the Phillips, um, but I also want to remind those you know who 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 may be new to your work um, that this work was was um, featured at at the uh, you know on the Phillips collection's Instagram, right? And it, it, you you were putting these up during a certain time frame from July twentieth to August seventh. 
on put, posting a few, you know, several um, images per week. And uh, um, th th this project will still be up, you know, even though, you know, in exhibitions, um, when we, you and I discussed this um, a few days ago, um, that, you know, th there's the idea of permanence versus impermanence, you know, where a museum is a very permanent structure with a very focused mission of collecting things and kind of placing them in context with the hopes of, you know, not having to reevaluate too much, yet we have a very loose and unstable format such as social media and Instagram where we really don't know what kind of staying power it has or will have. You know, can you kind of elaborate a little bit on that? Yes. Uh, I mean, the uh, time itself uh, as a topic has always been fascinating to me. Maybe uh, I should sh stop sharing uh, uh, in a moment and show you. I mean, one of the early, uh, I mean, not a superhero episodes uh, is uh, inside and outside time. This was like a, the case for a for a, a DVD and and uh, and. Um, flash drive uh, video uh, and in which I was also playing. Let me see if I can do it in reverse. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, so a flip book uh, and it comes also with an accordion style book. So um, let me try to pull it out. So the idea of, of the narrative incorporating time in uh, in uh, in a, in a Static form has always been interesting, and that's definitely part of the narrative structure of, uh, you, of, of the comic book. Do you, think that, do you think that there's a, a, a kind of irony there where, you know, um, artists produce things, they're producers, they, pro you know, generally speaking, they produce physical objects. And, you know, with, with something like Instagram or with even, you know, time-based media or, or, you know, various types of digital platform. Do you think that we're, we're losing knowledge to a certain degree, you know, because of, because of this, it, it, it's different where we're actually creating things that's housed in a collection or a library, but do you think that we're actually losing information? <laughs> well, um, we or, knowledge, or even knowledge for that. Yes, matter, yes, you I know? Would say, we, uh, knowledge. Yes, definitely. We are losing knowledge, but we didn't know what knowledge we are acquiring. A different kind of knowledge and actually and I find it particular I mean the we are still too fresh to new uh, to discover how uh, a younger generation who grew up only I mean from when they were kids uh, with Instagram or so on what how their sense of time of knowledge of absorbing information absorbing knowledge will be altered uh, I in my in, in this case also I was particularly interested I this is the first time I present a project through Instagram. The Astrodoubt uh, Instagram site is only about the story, the narrative of uh, the quarantine chronicles uh, through this pandemic. But the contrast between the speed uh, of the consumption of, uh, of Instagram and the time in a, we are living as a standstill. We are there here waiting for this vaccine, waiting to get out. We don't know what happened to 2010. Ah, yeah, 2020 was the year of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So somehow uh, how this, uh, this compression and dilution and dilation of time is, is for me was fascinating. And I've always been fascinating also the, this accordion style contract. Um, form and format and I that's also why I find the relationship playing between sculptural the static medium uh, of uh, of sculpture and the animation that you saw in some of the more recent posting and the long episode I'm working on is all about animating the sculptures which I made uh, five ten years ago in, in art, if I can interject, um, art, you know, from the artist's perspective, um, art, art is made oftentimes, you know, in response to things. So while you're making a commentary, um, generally speaking, on COVID and, and, and otherness and displacement, it's also by necessity in the, se in the sense that the Phillips collection physically had to close, right? But they still wanted to 
um, offer programming, um, offer everybody access. And so this project kind of satisfies that um, um, uh, through necessity. Well, this is actually, we, we have to credit Vesela, who, <laughs> saw, who saw my work on uh, Astrodout and made the connection and, and reached out to, to me and said, what about doing something for the Philips? And I said, well, I'm, I'm really so focused on Astrodout. The only thing I can do is having Astrodout in the Philips collection. <laughs> and said, yes, perfect. So uh, it worked out well, but... Um, um, yes, in, the, in fact, the ending uh, of the episode, uh, uh, particularly for the Philips, uh, um, what happened? I must have already, I dreamt, I must have dreamt again, I was in a museum. Of course, goes back to the longing for seeing real art. At the same time, looking and see what can we learn from the constraints. I'm also always thinking about how to turn the negative into a positive. Uh, so yes, out of all this uh, major catastrophe we are experiencing globally, what lessons are we learning? What, how our, our experience of life will be changed, our emotions, our notion of society, our interaction in good and bad. So I, it, it's something to think, I, you know what I talking about time, I do want to talk about space, space doubt in particular. So let me share, uh, am I sharing or not right now, the screen or not? Uh, we just see you. Okay, so let me share the screen. I want to show you just a clip of this, uh, giving you a preview of uh, the project I've been working for 10 years with uh, collaboration with NASA scientists and the, um, Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum, which um, started with uh, some of the uh, NASA scientists inviting, allowing me to use some of the equipment they utilize to train astronauts for outer space uh, uh, and for gravitylessness environment for the discrepancy between the visual and the vestibular system, the inner ear and so on. So these are, this actually was me in one of these machinery. So out of these uh, experiences, I began logging in a series of, uh, uh, of uh, artwork, ideas for artworks. Uh, that have multiple media, and I'm still working on that. And in fact, uh, Astrodout is, uh, uh, is um, one of the 180 ideas logged in that are part of this larger project of Spaced Out. Mm -hmm. And uh, this already, Astrodout itself uh, has about 200 drawings, uh, plus several photographs and videos and so on. But uh, it's something that will will uh, continue. And I feel me, so in a way, when the pandemic arrived, I was already in outer space. I was already thinking and imagining outer space as a, let's call it a floating signifier. Mm -hmm. Outer space can mean so much to many people. It can mean the search for an absolute, for a God, mm -hmm. for what we don't know, or could be the, the search for a different notion of time. When we look at stars, we don't see stars as they are, but we see them as they were millions of years ago. And so um, if I can interject, um, and I know we're, we're running very short on time now, Lucas, so forgive me, we wish we had <laughs> two more hours because we, 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 we could go, you know, even longer. Um, you know, if you were to, if one was able to kind of summarize, you know, th this experience, you know, or, or kind of a lesson learned, if, if, if you will. Um, it is that, it, you know, um, um, that there's, there's power in creativity, right? Um, that we're, we're, we're plagued with um, a, a pandemic, um, we're quarantined, and we're trying to do the best that we can with our domestic situation, with remote working, with remote interactions. But that doesn't mean that 
um, the creative process needs to suffer or be stifled. As a matter of fact, your project is a way of kind of showing that um, e even in a critical time such as this, um, you, an artist is, is not only important, but even more important because it, it, it reminds us of, of how we need to take some more time to detach um, whether we like it or not and take a bit longer to ponder um, big, big picture issues in many ways, you know, and how it relates to our life. And as an artist, um, you've definitely done that. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad you, you capture that. I definitely strongly feel that uh, creativity and humor have this, uh, give us this power to address uh, uh, important topics, but I, I would say something else. It's not just the creativity itself. It's also the acknowledgement of, of our vulnerability and our fragility. And so maybe that's why I felt oddly enough, particularly comfortable in this situation, because this is something I, I of course, I've been immersed here personally after my, my illness, but also when I came to the United States uh, 30 years ago, and uh, in the in finding myself not speaking the language well and try to address myself as a young artist among the hundreds of thousands and uh, finding a space. So and the awareness, the astral doubt, the doubt of astral doubt, the doubt of space doubt, something that comes from the acceptance of uh, our vulnerable dimension, the acceptance also of absurdity and that comes also from my passion for Kafka and Beckett. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and how, what can we learn from doubt? I think we can learn more from doubt that, than we can learn from certainties. Sure. And, sure. Uh, and that's why we are in a position where we are still struggling. What is the answer? What is coming next? What positive effect? And I'm not talking just about the elections. <laughs> uh, can this have... Uh, uh, on uh, on society yeah and uh, and saying that also the ability of looking in, inside ourselves but also looking at the universe at the same time yeah um, i think uh, i think that that's actually a, a, a great um kind of coda to to the presentation um and um if you don't mind we have about 15 minutes left um so we'd love to actually open it up to um the q a session so people can start you know interacting um, and right, you know, asking their questions. Yeah. Luca, if I yes. may jump in, a while ago you showed wonderfully how you actually make this work from original drawings to scanning to Photoshopping and then sizing them to Instagram format that is square, get your pictures of not square. Could you show us about that process from Actual drawing, a very old-fashioned drawing. Yeah, let me let me turn on the main lights because, because that second. is a fascinating process. <laughs> one second, okay. Now we can look at all the things on the wall. Is yes. <laughs> okay. so, here I am again. I okay. So for example, I just talking about the. Can you see well uh, with this slide now? Yes. Yes, we can see it. Okay, so. Uh, okay, let's talk about the Horace Pippin shot. So what I do, I, I, I put it vellum. I prefer the old way, the old style. I tape it on the screen. I trace, I draw around the reproduction from the Phillips collection size. And then uh, out of this, uh, let me get um, one that is maybe more characteristics. Um, okay, the Melu Jones, uh, the okay, the Orange speaking had the, the domino effect. So I had initially drawn this thing on the vellum, and then I I made it. I cut out this collage on paper, but then I wasn't happy because it was too too uh, rigid. So I made another one, which I'll show you in a moment, which was more reflective of the 
of the organic and more fluid nature of the, the, the work. But so basically, yes, what I do, I, I trace, I trace on paper and then uh, I import it in uh, Photoshop. And in this case, all the color is done uh, digitally in this particular series. As you can see from what you see in, in the back of uh, me, uh, uh, those the original drawings are eight and nine by 12 on paper. Some of them are larger because I ended up um, liking the drawing and I had to make sure that some of the parts were going to be included in the square format. So, but here actually, okay, I can show you other two. This is the, the one based on the Vuillard and this is the Bonard. I think I have the Bonard here. Actually, you know what? Let me share the screen because this may be of interest to you. Uh, share. Okay, here it is. The Okay, here I had, uh, this is the final scene. This is the painting. And uh, so I decided to squash it and make it into a window with a text, which I initially typed. Then I, that the window was too cramped. And then I decided, I had a drawing made from one of the Astro Doubt series, which had this image of Astro Doubt at the window. And I thought initially using this one and uh, then I changed the arm, the position of the arm, but then it was too uh, pr uh, prominent. It was overwhelming the work. So I decided to make it into a, just a sketched out uh, outline. So I, I, I made it on paper and then I scanned it. I overlapped it to the Photoshop and here it is. And then I began changing the, the works, the color of, of the different sentences. So I hope that this gives any sense. And then I changed the background, which initially was black. So there are many steps uh, originated in this. While in the other stories, uh, in most what I do, I just take a picture of the drawing, cropped it, increase the contrast because the paper is not fully black and the white is not fully white. And that's it, I don't do anything. Very rarely I had to change, I realized something was wrong or the letter when shrunk in a small scale was not very legible, so I have to go back to it. Mm. But I'm that's curious great. to hear now people's questions. Yeah, or, um, Other. And any questions out there for, for Luca? Um, I'm happy to jump in <laughs> with other things. But um, Luca, one of the great things, I guess we were, we were talking earlier about, you know, um, you know artists in, in some ways always finding inspiration in the creative process through even, even you know, dire times. And um, one of kind of the great outcomes of, of a format like this, you know, um, of, of discussing your work um, through Zoom is that it gives people a direct line into your studio, right? Um, it's not just about, you know, slides in the digital presentation, but it's really rewarding to be able to, you know, have Vesela, you know, ask you to, you know, go over your process and then you kind of lean over and bring the drawings on, show us some vellum and all the different layers and stuff like that. Because a lot of times that, that experience, even um, again, go, going back to the, the, the permanence of the museum as a structure and an institution, that's often lost. I mean, it's presented in some ways about preliminary drawings and things like that. But, you know, here it's actually very, very exciting because drawing is really at the core of, 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 of almost everything that you do, you know? Yes. That, that, that's very true. That's actually, um, um, Astro Doubt, um, he, he wears a suit. Um, he's, you know, aesthetically speaking, he, he, he's recognizable as a kind of Earth-based astronaut, yet is, is he, she, they from Earth, from another dimension? Or, you know, I mean, what, 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 why? It just seems as though Astro Doubt is always kind of, you know, is in a hurry to leave, which means, leads me to believe that, you know, Astro Doubt is not necessarily from here. So just curious, you know, what, 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 what can you reveal a little bit more of the backstory of Astro Doubt? Yes, no, Astro Doubt is, is very earthly, definitely. And, uh terrified of the environment, environmental crisis, terrified, it's just, but with the mind and imagination, of course, has the ability to travel 
and in a way also this is another parallel with the, the Philips collection uh, project that through allowing me to travel through time to different periods uh, show uh, I was able to re remind myself that that's what art and what museums do to have offer the opportunity to time travel mm -hmm. and uh, but yes uh, the roots of us are very much on the earth and uh, so yes, this is, uh, it's also again, a memento of our ability of uh, not only creativity, but of uh, transform danger, fear, war, death into something else. What do we do with this major? And this is something inherently human that uh, uh, if we have the ability to accept uh, this dimension, it's a way to not only survival a coping mechanism, but also a way to transform and hopefully create culture, create communication and create a dialogue. I would have never expected, to tell you the truth, I would have started an Instagram project based on AstroDoubt, even though I've been among AstroDoubt and astronauts for 10 years and shown on the internet and be talking to you right now, <laughs> uh, you and all. Uh, but this is how, what happened. I think is also learning from what the, the new communication channels can give us, how art is changing, how the galleries are changing, how museums are changing. It's a fascinating world. It is. Um, did, did you, did you um, actually, first yes, before, I, like I said, I have a million questions. Um, are there any other questions out there? Yes, yes this is Michael. Oh, yeah, go ahead, please. Hi. Uh, Luca? Yes. Hi, Michael. Uh, hi, how are you? There, there's a definite uh, political edge to your work. And, uh, you know, as a scientist and a poet, uh, I, I have to believe in what Auden said, which is that uh, poetry, art makes nothing happen. Do you believe that your art would change uh, the course of history during the quarantine uh, and uh, during the other issues that we face in the world at present? That's a nice question and um, it, it's up to you. If you're thinking of does art create revolutions uh, that's a story that goes beyond. I'm thinking about the ability, the human ability to transform events, transform events into something else. How and where this can end, uh, we don't know. If I'm asking, if I have the ambition to change the world through my own pro, uh, project, uh, you're catching me <laughs> because of course every, artists and all artists are delusional and everybody <laughs> thinks, that, <laughs> thinks that they can change the world maybe they can plant the seed they can provide awareness they can begin a conversation they can be in a dialogue that someone who wants to devote their lives to politics and dealing with the grassroots movement and providing the energy to have people vote to help create a reform but uh, I'm not planning to become a politician and uh, I'm content uh, to address my work in this context, which to tell you the truth was not even the art context. I initially made it and actually there was no art reference. The word art never came into the astrolab until I think maybe after the 40 post, after 150 drawings. It was done mostly for a larger audience, the comic book audience, uh, web comics, yes. and many of the people were that don't know very much when I, I, I grew up, I did not know what art was. I guess I could see reproductions, there were churches and so on, but what I was really interested in was uh, the ability to communicate about personal issues, the existential, how the self uh, relates to society. And in that sense, yes, art, all art is political. Most of it is politically conservative. So what can we do out of it? Begin a conversation, it's something. And then someone else will continue and maybe put in practice. Well, that's a, that's a good observation because I think a lot of times people will, will lose sight of the fact that um, it, virtually every action that we do 
is political in, in some, to some degree, but the, there's a difference between, you know, not being able to control the political and actively politicking. You're not actively politic, or at least that's my impression of your work. You know, you, 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 if, if anything, you are tilting the mirror back toward the observer to kind of, you know, see yourself as Astrodout in many ways, or you can see yourself as Astrodout. We can be an Astrodout. We are an Astrodout. We will be an Astrodout. Yes, yes, no, very good point, yes. Um, I don't know if we should uh, let other people continue. Uh, yes, any other questions? Please jump in. <laughs> Thank you. I am thinking about time. You have that wonderful visual metaphor of the accordion book, and we can conflate time and expand time. I am thinking about how many works of art we have in the Phillips collection and how much time it would take to look at everyone, to choose how to tell a story about COVID and your own personal experience with suffering. I just wondered, did you, do you regret leaving any out? Do you have another work of art that you want to add to it if you could continue? Can you talk a little bit about that process of choosing? Well, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I love a lot of the works of the Phillips collection, I would say. So it's been definitely, initially, the idea was to narrow down to 10 because 10 is the maximum number of images that we could post in one single post in an Instagram. And, but because we were not sure that we would have achieved obtain the rights, the copyrights for some of them, I expanded, I did two extra ones. Luckily, thanks to Vesela, we got the copyrights for all of them. So at the end, uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't want to turn two down anymore, but uh, yes, I, I there were so many others. Uh, I would spend uh, hours and hours and days in the Philips collection. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, and I'm glad that some of you are as fond of the collection as uh, you are and I am. Thank you for your question. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Please feel free to jump in. I just made a comment. Maybe we look at do part two. <laughs> you mean another story? Okay. Well, in true comic book form, there's always a part two, three, four, five. <laughs> that sounds like an easy proposition. And I like it's people who followed Astrid out. They I, they know that I like coming soon. Next, yes. it's a lot of the. It's actually often there are more coming soon than the actual story, <laughs> the actual episode. The idea of the expectation. The idea of this constant promise. So yeah, maybe, yes. Maybe it will be animated, figure out how to do animation without uh, overwhelming the, the, the- I was going to ask about animation because we talked separately about possibly taking this into another dimension. <coughs> you wanna say a little bit about that or it's still to be decided? Uh, well, I think you and I have to talk about that because it's a lot of work to do animation. animation as will satisfy me. Uh, so, and uh, the, it, of course, in this case, uh, but, but it's possible, yes, it's doable. Yeah. Okay. Well, Can I, I speak? Go ahead, oh yes, please, go ahead. Okay, I want to tell you, and thank you so much for doing this. It's, for me, it's such a special experience to get to hear an artist describe how you do this and describe the process by which you created this work and how you connected them. It in increases for me the meaning of what I'm seeing. Thank you. I'm not just, especially since so often, and it's what I see, I can read what somebody has written about the artist, but I constantly in my teaching will say, but we weren't there. We don't really know what the artist was thinking while he was making it. We guess. We look and we can guess, but it's so different. And thank you. And I so thank the museum. Because you're helping me with my isolation. 
where I am. You know what, this is a very good point. One of the things I forgot to mention is that the idea of using Instagram, and initially, I mean, for the first uh, month or two months, I was posting daily, so making five, 10 drawings. It was really an, a, a nonstop process, but also was a way to, to send, uh, because in that time, New York had this very high uh, level of danger of COVID deaths and so on. And it was a way to send a message to my family, to my friends. I'm still alive. I'm here. I'm okay. And if for two or three days, some, maybe my brother would not see any post, he would text me, Luca, are you okay? <laughs> so uh, it was an interesting process of, uh, and, and other people, friends of mine who, who when I started to, to slow down the process, told me, no, no, please don't stop because we need that. We need that. So I am glad that in the, I mean, the infinitely insignificant uh, experience uh, I am creating and that I had through my own uh, health issues, I'm communicating to other people uh, like you, like other friends and so on, and, uh, and addressing something which is universal, our condition, human conditions. I mean, ultimately the, our loneliness, our desire to communicate, uh, our, again, uh, vulnerability, our ambition, aspiration to reach the universe. Uh, so thank you for your comment. I really appreciate it. I see a question. Uh, yes. Let me see. There was one question, and then that that should be the last question. Uh, I'm curious to know about the solitary nature nature of the astronaut. Did you think that the astronaut? Did, did you think about the astronaut living in artificial bubble prior to COVID, prior to cancer diagnosis? Uh, the astronaut seems very different to the artist, which is present and very much in touch with their senses. Uh, good comment. Uh, well, there, is a, there was a transition, although, I mean, the, the series spaced out in which uh, this character, Astrodot, was already living, but not in a narrative form, was living as a sculpture or as a drawing, as you saw in the clip I show you, did not have uh, the, the cancer diagnosis, but was addressing, yes, isolation, was addressing the the fear. And so in a way it was very, I, I would say, unfortunately, I can say I predicted <laughs> this uh, uh, condition because it, of course, it's something that we always live in. And when we forget the euphoria and when we forget that happiness comes in moment, we, we shouldn't live in a state of permanent happiness. We can also accept the variety of uh, emotional um, states uh, as part of life uh, and actually we can enjoy happiness more if we experience of course all the up and down I mean I'm saying obvious things of course now but in the relationship to the artist uh, Selena um, the artist seems uh, the astronaut seems very different to the artist who's present in touch with their senses um, I'm not sure about that <laughs> is the artist present and in touch with their senses I think it um, in, in, in terms of the involvement with the physical, the physicality of our being, uh, the flesh of the world, uh, as all human beings uh, share, uh, yes, the artist is more in contact in the production of an object, even though much art now is made without the need of an object. Uh, it's just an image that is material and liquid very much like paint before it solidifies. And, uh, but uh, there are so many individual responses to artists. There are people who are present because all oh, art is present, but also removed each person in their own universe. And that's what makes it interesting, our living in a constellation constellation of beings before being a constellation of stars. Well, that said, Luca, we have a beautiful sky here in DC, clear and sunny. Maybe we'll have some stars tonight and maybe we'll just join the astronaut in a, another imaginary space with you or alone. 
I'd like to uh, thank everybody for joining us tonight and spending some time together and learning from you and then Taras about your work. Taras, thank you so much for participating in the Phillips program. Stay mm -hmm. tuned. Maybe Luca could do more. And yes, please. Well, I want to thank all of you uh, for joining this uh, Zoom conference and uh, this lecture. Thank you, uh, Taras, uh, uh, for making these very interesting questions and challenging questions. Vesela, of course. But uh, I'm glad and I hope this begins a conversation. I'm reachable through Instagram or email, of course, <laughs> if you have any other questions that. Uh, I, you missed or you usually I'm also very slow despite this the speed of astroed out I usually think about things a lot and uh, the question comes up afterwards so I'm happy to try to respond to it um, so again thanks and enjoy if you haven't done it enjoy on astroed out on Instagram and uh, and on the Phillips website through uh, December check it out Yes, and the project is, uh, is on, as uh, Tara Small pointed out, uh, is online on the website uh, until December 15th. And then, uh, who knows, will disappear, who knows. <laughs> That's it. Thank you so much and have a good evening, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye, bye. Bye. thank you. Thank you, Luca. Uh, I was reading the comments. Okay. okay, thank you very much, Miguel. I'm sorry I didn't thank you. We'll see you soon. Thank you so much for everything. Great job. Okay, bye. Thank you. Bye. Um...